Welcome to the Sanctuary of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We are so excited that you tuned in for Friday Night Word. Over the past several years, we've been blessed by you, your comments, your encouragement for our media ministry. You may feel that we have helped you, but we want you to know you've been a blessing to us. And because of that, the Lord put in our spirit to do Friday night word. This is an opportunity as you come to the close of your week to hear a word from God that carries you through the weekend and into the next week. We know that weekends can be hectic and sometimes we may forget to tune in on Sunday. And so this is yet another opportunity for God to speak to you on what he has specifically for you. We pray that Friday night word is a blessing to you. I have been praying for you. I may not know some of you all's names. I may never see your face. But I want you to know I have been praying that this moment bless you, liberate, and transform your life. We are excited to have you as part of the family of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. And for those of you that often hear it, and those of you that may be hearing this for the first time, we never start a worship service here at Liberty Baptist Church without this affirmation. Something that is great for Sunday and only for Sunday. But we declare today that this word is good for Friday. And so without any further ado, I declare friends and family, it's church time. It's church time. Oh, yes, it's church time. Welcome to Friday Night Word. Be blessed.
Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. For I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. What a wonderful melody of song. It's good to remind, be reminded that we will, not maybe, but we will give thanks unto the Lord. There is a word from the Lord today in the New Testament book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 16 and 17. First Peter 2, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> and as you search for the scripture, I will make note today that this will not be a Father's Day sermon. Sometimes events happen in the world and in space and time that you have to take a break from tradition. And you have to address the climate of today. So in 1 Peter 2, verses 16 and 17, we have a word from the Lord on today. As God changed my attention to more pressing matters for our community on today. In 1, Corinth, 1 Peter 2, 16 and 17, and as is our custom, won't you hold your Bibles high and repeat after me? This is the Word of God. It has liberated and transforming power. I will praise God for this preaching moment. And I declare that after this moment, that I shall never, ever be the same. God be praised. In 1 Peter 2, verses 16 and 17, specifically today in the New International Version. I want you to read your other versions when you get home, and you'll see why the Lord led me to the New International Version. These words are faithfully recorded. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God, showing proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the King. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word, the edification of our hearts and our souls. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Live as free men. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. I want to talk today for a few moments from the subject, America's Great Cover-Up. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. America's Great Cover-Up. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here on this day that we call Father's Day. God, we thank you for keeping us from day to day, week to week, hour to hour, minute to minute, and second by second. Now, Lord, touch the words of my mouth. Let them not be of my own understanding nor my opinion. But Lord, may they fall fresh from you. Someone may be liberated and transformed by the renewing of their mind. This indeed is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A 
America's great cover-up. First Peter was written to the early Christian church in Greco-Roman culture that often found themselves struggling with social tensions and suffering from the aftermath of those social tensions in society. First Peter encouraged these Christians struggling and suffering in Greco-Roman culture to imitate Christ. The message to this church of antiquity is simple, to imitate our Lord. By this imitation, the writer of 1 Peter provides a framework of Christian ethics for the church, a framework by which we operate and we coexist as we continue our plight to achieve the ethical challenge of being in the world but not of the world. So this Christian ethic provided by the writer of 1 Peter has us exemplify the essence and the mind of Christ. This morning's text encourages us within our ethical framework to live free, free of inhibition, free of mind, free of heart, and free of soul. But interesting enough, it also asks us not to use our freedom for a cover-up for evil. It expounds on the necessity of freedom, but yet it draws us into the potential for freedom to in fact be a cover-up for evil. It warns us that freedom rhetoric is not freedom. It warns us that freedom writing is not freedom. It warns us that sticking our chest out as if we are free men is not the real essence of freedom. And as we keep on living, we'll find that there are folk that will specialize in the rhetoric of freedom, but never quite break their chains. The text, therefore, understanding the complexity of freedom and how freedom itself can root us into a cover-up for evil. The text further informs us of a prerequisite for freedom. Freedom ain't free, y'all. Freedom comes at a price. Freedom comes at a level of discomfort. Freedom comes at a level of sacrifice. So as the writer of 1 Peter encourages us to live free, he then gives us in verse 17 the cost of freedom. He says, love your brother. But you're not free if you can't love your brother. He further reminds us that we got to look out for the believers. We have to imitate Christ. And so the cost of freedom is love because freedom is the exact byproduct of love. Because when I was sinking this deep in sin, far beyond the peaceful shore. Love lifted me. So the writer of 1 Peter gives us a profound example that freedom comes at a cost, and that cost must be love. Think about that. If you can't love, you're not free. If you can't love, then your freedom is nothing but a cover-up for hatred. If you can't love, your freedom is nothing but a cover-up for bias. And yes, it's a cover-up for ignorance. Because if you cannot love, you are really not living in the context of God's freedom. I'm not talking about Webster's Dictionary Freedom. I'm not talking about Oprah's, Dr. Phil's definition of freedom. I'm talking about God's freedom. And God's freedom comes at a cost comes at a price that we ought to love our brothers and our sisters. America has at its core the Christian principles of the founding fathers. 
and a repertoire of freedom rhetoric as its greatest attribute. Nobody can talk about freedom like America. Nobody can wave a flag like America. No one can adorn the colors of a proud nation like America. However, our one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, has at its assets or its currency in God we trust. Has in its historical DNA freedom as a cover-up for its greatest evil. America, I'll say it again, at its core, has the Christian principles of the founding fathers and the repertoire of freedom rhetoric as its greatest attribute. However, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, that dares to have on its greatest asset, currency in God we trust, has historical DNA with freedom as its greatest cover-up for evil. Freedom, covering up, masking the atrocities of slavery. Masking the horrors of the Middle Passage. Masking the raping and the degradation of women, masking the castration of black men. Facebook might cut this off, but I don't care. It has at its historical DNA profound rhetoric that's thrown over years of atrocity in an effort to make you forget what had been done. So several days ago, President Biden signed into law Juneteenth as a national holiday. America's greatest cover-up for the evil of hatred, evidence through racism. I hope you caught the form. I hope you caught evil breeds hatred that brought about the act of racism. So a few days ago when he signed the bill, now exposing racism that was masked by a disingenuous claim of freedom for all. To some, it was new, and for others, it affirmed. One of the greatest atrocities perpetuated on one human by another did not occur overseas, did not occur in Japan, occurred right here in my country, Tisabee, sweet land of liberty of the IC. So at that very moment of the signing, masks began to be unveiled over the face of our nation. Terrorists. Before there was Bin Laden, there were terrorists. Brother Leek, they came to Africa and took our resources. Terrorists that burned down Tulsa, Oklahoma. But see, they only want to tell you part of the story. They ain't telling you how they messed up folks in Chicago and beat up businessmen in New York and, and lynched freedom riders down south. That wasn't the only place that burned down. So we stood with a level of pride because America's greatest cover-up Seemingly slowly but surely is not escaping our gaze no longer. 
So President Biden signed into law, as you all know, just a few days ago, Juneteenth, which specifically meant the date June 19th, 1865, when General Gordon Granger announced General Order Number Three, enforcing freedom of enslaved Africans in Texas, which was then the last state of the former Confederacy in which slavery was still being permitted by state government. This act in general order number three was ironic because it took place in what we know as Juneteenth, which was over two years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on September 1862 that was effective on January 1st, 1863. America's great cover-up. I hope in your amens you followed the date. The president signs the Emancipation Proclamation ending the greatest atrocity from one human to another, barring the Holocaust in September of 1862, but there was no emergency to do it then. They had to wait. They had to wait to January 1st. There was no immediacy. America's greatest cover-up for evil is his freedom. In this land of the free, home of the brave, our great founding father could not impress upon those that were in his purview to do it right now. They said, we'll let them stay captive for three more months. Somebody ought to tell the story. So within the very essence of the series of events, the cover-up now begins to be unfolded, and yes, it was terrible that two years later they had to wait in Texas, and it was equally as terrible that three months after the immediacy of the worst thing that could have ever happened, they said, hold up, wait a minute. When we get around to it three months from now, we're going to let y'all make some more money for three months. America's greatest cover-up. So in the midst of freedom, there was political protocol. There was political jostling. There was political focus that was not concerned with the human need. It was concerned with one group moving ahead of the other. And for over 400 years, black folks have been caught in the middle of the political fight and never getting nothing out of it. We tell you to wait a few months to get your freedom. Further, illustrating the cover-up, it's not only the timing of the Emancipation Proclamation, not only General Order Number 3 marking Juneteenth, but even more ironic than the prior two episodes was that over 80 years prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, our nation made a claim and was called the Declaration of Independence. Signed on July 4th, 1776. So 80 years, over 80 years prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, over 80 years prior to the Juneteenth General Order Number 3, our country made the claim of freedom in the Declaration of Independence by saying these poetic words of the five founding fathers. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, 
liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, this harmonious prose of the Declaration of Independence did not apply to those that were probably on that same July 4th being packed down in boats in the transatlantic slave trade. It did not account on July 4th uh, for those of our ancestors that were on the shores of Accra, Ghana, and Sierra Leone forced to defecate on themselves. Go through one of the most treacherous travel trips that mankind could ever know. But on that day, the cover-up kept going. Our great ancestor, Frederick Douglass, if you don't want to believe Hunt about it, listen to Frederick Douglass about it. Frederick Douglass captures the sentiments of these enslaved Africans and their relationship with July 4th, Independence Day, in his speech in Rochester, New York, in 1852, almost a decade before the Emancipation Proclamation and Juneteenth. Frederick Douglass asked the question, what to America is the 4th of July? He asked the rhetorical question, and then he answers and says, I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Frederick Douglass, what is the 4th of July to the slave? Given the historical context of us on these hallowed shores, and don't get me wrong, I ain't going back to Africa no time soon. I'm going to stay right here in Chicago because this is our land. We built it and we made it. But you can't never fix home if you don't tell home what the problem is. So there may be some, and I, and I don't know, I don't know, some may agree, some may disagree, but I didn't come by here today for you to agree or disagree. I came here to prick your mind. <laughs> Whatever end you come out on, if you have come out today a better thinker about your situation, if you have come out today a better thinker about the advancement of our people, then God's assignment for me today was done. First Peter. Therefore, given our historical context, is not only a message to antiquity, but it is apropos in today's society. Freedom, the greatest byproduct of God's love, must not be taken for granted and used to turn our attention from our inward ills. Freedom ought not be so blinding to us of the injustice that it is occurring around us. Ought not be so blinding to us that we forget the lack of health care and education that is around us ought not be so blinding to us that we not see that our own people are losing their mind. However, if freedom rooted in love is our aim, if freedom rooted in love if I, is our modus operandi, then it ought to require us to take an inward look in our souls, an inward work in our souls. Now, don't look in my soul, look in your own soul. Stay in your own lane, look in your own heart. Stop talking about across the aisle, the middle of the aisle, just check on your seat. And if love is our aim, it will take an inward look in our souls, so palatable, so powerful, that it will require our nation, it will require you and I to kneel at the throne room of God and repent our nation's sins. This inward look calls us, we're not there yet, y'all, to kneel in the throne room of 
back off and repent of our sins. Beloved, I am inspired and hopeful given the events of the past few days. Not only the events of the past few days, but thoughtful discussions regarding race in major forums throughout this year. However, I remain cautiously optimistic with a little bit of dose of skepticism and cynicism. I sit cautiously optimistic and skeptical because as I recanted our history today, our over 400 years struggle dictates to me that I ought to proceed with caution. Some people might say of other ilks, get over it. There they go, everything we do ain't nothing right. No, my experience in understanding history says in 400 years we ought to proceed with caution. This sudden paradigm in the shift of the consciousness as it seems of America now has, is comfortable with expressions of days gone by that are over 100 years overdue. And so my question is, why now? We've been poor, but why now? We've been locked out, but why now? Sometimes we can get so involved in the process of our celebration that we don't ask the question, why now? I don't purport to know the answer to why now, but I got a few suggestions today. Why now? Well, to some degree, the nation as a child, if I might use Drew today, we used to have a cookie jar on the counter in our house. And Drew, once she thought we were not looking, would pull her chair up to the cookie jar and try to get some of Daddy's cookies. And I would come and look in the cookie jar, because I was eating the cookies too, and say, Drew, did you eat my cookies? Drew loved the Lord from an early age, so Drew said, no, Daddy. <laughs> you must have ate the cookies. Sometime, I would tiptoe down our stairs to the first level. After I would see her, not in her room. There I could find Drew with the top off of the cookie jar, eating one cookie with her left hand and reaching for the next with her right hand. And then she would say, Daddy, I'm sorry. Well, my friends, why not? Because America got his hands caught in the cookie jar. Got his hands caught in the cookie jar of injustice. Got his hands caught in the cookie jar of hatred. Got his hands caught in the cookie jar of inequity. And when he got his hands caught in the cookie jar under the knee of Derek Chauvin on George Floyd's neck, he couldn't help but say, I'm sorry. So my 400 years of historical context tells me how to proceed cautiously optimistic because baby, you just said you sorry because you got your hand in the cookie jar. I'd rather a man 
didn't tell me. I've been in the cookie jar. Then repent because they got caught in the cookie jar. So maybe they'll do like Drew. Bat them eyes at me. Say, Daddy, I love you. I'll never, ever do it again. But one month later, was back in. That's why we got to proceed with caution. Take these strides, but tell our nation, keep your hands out of my cookie jar. Not only keep your hands out, but put a little more cookies in there. Put a little more substance in there. Don't give me a holiday. Give me a little more education. Don't, don't give me a little holiday. Clean up my streets. As I drove down Michigan on my way to church, get them pop bottles. Put something in my cookie jar. I'm further skeptical of the agenda. Because I got to ask the question today, is this a real step toward reconciliation? Not only reconciliation, but some level of reparation. You can give me a party, but I need some money to throw the party with. You can get the crowd, but I need a tax break. Don't think all black folk ain't middle class. We need a tax break. Can I get a witness up in here? So we need reconciliation and we need reparation to the descendants of enslaved Africans. But here's the agenda fueled by the black eye our experience in this nation has put on our country. Our experience has put such a black eye on America that, that America is like a boxer in the corner that needs a cut man. Because their eyes are now shut due to the abuse that have been put on others. And so, it's because the black eye so clear that our agenda, our recognition, is simply a step in the process for another agenda. Could it be that what happened to us is so atrocious that you really can't go by what you did wrong to black folks without liberating some other folks. Maybe you can't liberate other nationalities unless you address the black eye of the black man, and black woman in America. And so your process is not really of reconciliation or reparation, your process it simply involves easing the way for another agenda. It's funny how drugs became a national pandemic when it hit the suburbs. Crack cocaine been all over Chicago and LA for years, but oh, 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 and now that there's killing in the suburbs, now it's killing in the suburbs, it's because of depression. Black folk been depressed for a long time, been locked out for a long time. People have been raised with nothing for a long time. But nobody ever gave us the out of depression or mental illness. May have been the case. So you got to be careful. Maybe the agenda that looks like it's for you might just be for somebody else. Somebody once said, somebody once said in seminary, I heard that the greatest benefactor of the civil rights movement was not black folks, it was white women. Y'all will catch that on another day. If Facebook ain't cut me off, I'm almost screwed, so I don't want them to cut me off. They've cut me off before. Y'all just didn't know it. These are questions, why now, 
that permeate my thoughts and are part of my intimate discussions with God. Despite my cautious optimism and skepticism, skepticism, one thing that I'm clear on today as I leave you with the good news. No matter what the agenda is, God is in control. I declare today with whatever the devil might mean for bad, God means it for my good. I declare today that I'll take nothing for our journey now because God is in control. Because when the devil thought he had us, God worked something out for us. When we should have been given up when we should have been dead. God lifted us up and brought us out. I know that the Lord is in control. So no matter what the reasons or agenda, after we buy our t-shirts of Juneteenth, and after we host our profound barbecues laid with bid whisk and spades, after we have our Juneteenth, Celebrations let us not allow our zeal for freedom cloud our gaze of the reality of the work that is still left to do. So after you buy your shirt and after you have your barbecue, understand that we are still a long way from declaring the free at last sentiment of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We still have a long way to go now. Let us remember as Dr. King stated, that even after the Emancipation Proclamation, some hundred years later, at that time, now 50 years further now in this time, the black man still is not free. We are still not free. No, we no longer have changed. We no longer sing Negro spirituals in the hot sun of the house, but now our minds are locked up. Now our priorities are chained up, and you might as well be chained to a tree. Because we say, hey, boss, thank you. Sir, thank you for taking care of us. I guess we's free now. No, we're not free, Joe Biden. No, we're not free, Donald Trump. No, we're not free, and we got some more fighting, some more consciousness. Don't give me no holiday and think my fight's done. I'm encouraged as we officially celebrate Juneteenth, annually now. I'm encouraged today not simply by the words of scholars, philanthropists, politicians, and, free, and preachers. As I celebrate, I'm encouraged more by a greater cloud of witnesses than even that. I'm encouraged by my ancestors who were in bondage. I'm encouraged because I know that we stand on the promises of God to their prayers. So I'm encouraged more than scholars, philanthropists, politicians, and preachers. I'm inspired by our ancestors, enslaved Africans, who believed that one day God was going to trouble the water. I'm inspired by them because they believed that the God of the Exodus was deeply rooted in their emancipation. So I believe that they believed. I believe that although they had limited resources, they knew that the earth was the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. I believe that although they were told that their ways of worship were archaic and primitive and unsophisticated, they developed their own melodies, their own step, their own dance, their own hoop, and their own experience with whatever was holy. I am forever inspired by them. I am forever inspired by them. Because as Abel's blood cried from the ground at the hands of his brother, as Abel's blood cried from the ground at the hands of his blood, brother, I'm, in, I'm inspired because I know the ancestors' blood cries from the ground because they were murdered at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan flies from the ground and says that we can make it if we press our way. Their blood cries from the trees of the south, 
dripping down into the roots, looking like strange fruit of Billie Holiday. Their blood cries from the concrete jungles of Chicago, cries from the rural stations of the South, cries even now from the suburbs of major cities, cries letting us know that God is not through with us yet. So although I'm cautiously optimistic and skeptic, I am profoundly encouraged that the same God that came to their rescue, the same God that took them from the outhouse and put us in the White House, the same God that took them from illiteracy and put us in PhDs, the same God that put them in dark at camp meetings but has given us great cathedrals. I am encouraged today that the same God that brought them through is the same God that hears our fainting cry, the same God that answers by and by, the same God to his people in the present age. One day when the truth is more important than prestige, one day when the calamity of a nation is exposed. One day, when the covers are pulled off for of the eels of years gone past. One day, when truth outweighs prestige and actions outweigh rhetoric, we will sing these words. We will sing these words for our ancestors, but we won't sing them alone. We alone, we're gonna sing them side by side with the beloved Christian community. We're gonna sing it with some Asians. We're gonna sing it with the brown. We're gonna sing it with the white. We're gonna sing it with the Native American. We're gonna sing the words one day when it's all over. When it's all over and truth exceeds prestige and action outweighs rhetoric, we will sing in a hallelujah octave. Quite like what was expressed, I'm surely, on Juneteenth, I can imagine their excitement. I can imagine their shout to realize that they were free. Well, one day all God's children are going to sing together, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory, victory today is mine. We pray you enjoy this evening's Friday Night Word. I know that you have been blessed, and I know that you are stronger now than what you were before you tuned in. We thank you for being a part of this ministry. And if you want to give to this ministry and support to this ministry, we invite you to give to Givelify, PayPal, or Cash App. And you can also give 
If you do not have the monetary means, you can give to this ministry by sharing the good news and sharing this message with your family and friends and telling everyone about Friday Night Word and about Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We pray that God's peace will be with you until we meet again.